eternal God, that we may please you in our lives, maybe to your glory, give to us those things that we need, cause us to ask for those things, to seek those things that please you. In Jesus' name, amen. A world in need now summons us to labor, love, and give to make our life an offering to God that all may live. Take that out. The church is calling us to make the dream come true. A world redeemed by Christ-like love. Okay, this is going to have to go. It shows no consciousness of election. 20th century. Nice little romanticism. Very Pauline, not too much of the Gospels. Goodbye. Um, we turn our attention to hit the kings of Israel and Judah. Written by George Rawlinson, Camden Professor of Ancient History in the University of Oxford. Published in New York City. <clears throat> Second, we'll tool down here. The preface, the books of Kings and Chronicles form the main source for the history of the kings of Israel and Judah. They require, however, to be supplemented, especially for the latter kings, by a careful study of the prophetic scriptures, particularly Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Micah, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. Local coloring, the life with the events described, are derivable almost wholly from this latter source, which furnishes them with often intolerable abundance. The antiquities of Josephus supply less material than might be expected. And the character of all additional material derived from this quarter requires to be weighed in the scales of a careful and sober criticism. Considerable light is thrown on the history of some of the kings by contemporary notices in the monuments of Egypt and Assyria. It has been the endeavor of the writer, so far as the limits of space allowed, to make full use of all these various sources of information. His labors have been much lightened by the excellent work done by many of his predecessors in the field of sacred history, especially by the writers of the articles on several kings in Dr. Smith's Dictionary of the Bible, Kiddo's Biblical Cyclopedia, Weiner's Ray, Rael Vorterbuch, and Ersch and Gruber's Cyclopedia. He is indebted also largely to the graphic and brilliant narrative of his lamented friend, Dean Stanley, whose lectures on the Jewish church, though on some points they give an uncertain sound, contain the best account of the divided monarchy which at present exists in the English language. Ewald's History of the People of Israel. I'm going to make a note of that. Ewald. Uh, has also been consulted throughout, but more sparingly used. The, the writer's absolute rejection of the miraculous, rendering him an untrustworthy commentary on a period of history wherein, according to the authorities, the miraculous played a prominent part. From Oxford in 1889, George Rawlinson. Contents, chapter 1 is Rehoboam. Chapter 2, Jeroboam the first. With a, it's got a lengthy description of things that will be covered under Jeroboam 1. Abijah, chapter 3. Chapter 4 is Asa, who succeeds Abijah. Chapter 5, Nadab, which is very brief. Chapter 6, Baasha. 7, Ella. 8, Zimri. 
9, Omri, 10, Ahab, <coughs> 11, Jehoshaphat, 12, Ahaziah of Israel. This looks like a very good source book. 14, Jer Jehoram of Judah, uh, 15, Haziah of Judah, 16, Jehu, 17, Athaliah, 18, Joas of Judah, uh, 19, Jehoahaz, 20, Jehoash or Joash, 21, Amaziah, 22, Jeroboam II, 23, Uzziah or Azariah, 24, Zechariah, Shalom and Menachem, 25, Pekah, Haya, and Warp, and Pekah. 26, Jotham. 27, Ahaz. 28, Oshea. 29, Hezekiah. 30, Manasseh, the disaster. 31, Ammon, the disaster. 32, Josiah. 33, Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim. 34, Jehoiakim and Zedekiah. That should be it. Chapter 1, Rehoboam. Education of Rehoboam. Influence of his mother, Naama. His early companions. His accession. It's really kind of interesting the way they put a chapter summary with just dashes. Uh, not necessarily complete sentences, but just basic ideas, demand for a redress of grievance, how met, consequent revolt of the ten tribes, threat of war, erection of fortifications, exodus of the Levites from Israel, religious corruption of Judah, expedition of Shishak, later years of Rehoboam, his domestic relations, his character. <clears throat> the court of Solomon, where Rehoboam was brought up, has been described in a former volume of this series. A place where such wealth, luxury, and such unrestrained polygamy were rife was not a school apt for the formation of a strong and self-reliant character. When it is said that Rehoboam grew through boyhood to manhood, in an atmosphere of an eastern harem, enough is said to account for all that followed. And that's what Solomon had was a harem. And a hair in harem princesses waited on by obsequious eunuchs and petted by their mother and her fe female slaves passed their time in softness and idleness without any training worthy the name, without the spur of emulation flattered, fond upon, courted, encouraged to regard themselves as being of a superior kind who can scarcely do no wrong, or to be indulged in every desire and every fancy, and are never to be checked or thwarted. A judicious father shortens as much as possible the duration of this time of trial, early sending his sons out to the wars, or giving them civil employment, or at any rate, removing them from the Ginaikum, G-Y-N, woman museum, so to speak. It's an interesting phrase. I don't think I've ever seen that before in English. Excuse me. A little accident here. Uh, um, but the Greek helps us here in placing them under the direction and guidance of carefully chosen, chosen tutors and instructors. But Solomon, from the time that he fell away, is not likely to have been a judicious father or to have greatly troubled himself concerning the training of his children. There were no wars to which he could send them, but he seems not to have employed them in civil government. Rehoboam, so far as appears, grew to manhood, 
as a mere hanger on upon the court, the center of a group of young men brought up with him and eager to flatter his foibles. The enforced idleness of an heir apparent in all countries, and especially in the East, constitutes a severe trial to all but the best balanced natures, which are the great trial peril of youth at every period of world's history. They're not perhaps entitled to conclude absolutely from the many passages of the Proverbs where the evil doings of young men are rebuked, that Solomon is actually glancing at the conduct of Rehoboam or using the expression, my son, in any other than a general sense. But still the frequency and urgency of the remonstrances naturally raise the suspicion that, in part at least, a personal motive underlies them as a personal element appears distinctly in what the wise king says, Proverbs 4, 3 to 4, of his own education, <coughs> and instruction. So it may well be that keen reproofs and reproaches addressed to the foolish son are barbed by a personal sentiment of regret and disapproval. It does not appear that Rehoboam, during his youth, had any special guide or instructor. Noah's indicated his standing to him in the relation in which Nathan had apparently stood to his father, the prophet Shemaiah, who was the mentor of, it, of his later life, received no mission to speak to him until he was king. The chief share in his early education, if it may be allowed the name, must have been taken from his mother, Naama. Now, Naama was an Ammonitess. She was one of those foreign women, princesses, whom Solomon took to wife very early in his reign and who ultimately turned away his heart so that he became an actual worshiper of false gods. It was for her principally that he built the high place to Molech, or Milcom, on the hill that is over against Jerusalem, directly in front of the temple, that is, on the northeast crest of Olivet. According to the Septuagint translators, she was the daughter of Hanun, the king of Ammon, with whom David had the war, provoked by the ill treatment of his ambassadors, Second Samuel. 10. Her influence over her son can scarcely have been for good. Brought up an idolatress who cannot blame her that she remained one till her marriage and the transference of her residence to Jerusalem. But her determined adherence to the bloody rites of Moloch after the full acquaintance with the religion of Jehovah indicates moral blindness and the hardness of heart which would make her a most undesirable instructress of youth. We can scarcely doubt but that she took her son with her when she attended the worship of Molech in the sanctuary built by Solomon for her use on Mount Olivet and introduced him to a knowledge of the bloody and probably licentious rites of the Ammonite religion. The strong leaning toward the worst forms of idolatry, which Rehoboam showed after mounting the throne, is not surprising in one subjected to the influence of such a mother at the most impressible period of human existence. <clears throat> it is not recorded that Rehoboam had any brothers, but we can scarcely suppose that he was without them. Solomon's wives numbered at least 70. It would be preposterous to imagine that they were all sonless. Among the young men that grew up with him, 1 Kings 12.10, were doubtless several who stood towards him in near relationship, if not of a full brother, at any rate, a half-brother. These persons would naturally be among the earliest and most intimate companions brought up under the influence of their several mothers as he of his 
they would lean to their mother's cults and practically impress upon him the syncretism, which was Solomon's idea of religion in his later life. Rehoboam could scarcely have looked on Jehovah as more than a local god to the respect of the Israelites and to a continuous worship in the splendid tel temple which Solomon had built in his honor. But his own personal leanings would seem to have been toward the foreign rights which his father had established upon Israelite soil. Compare, there's a footnote here, Solomon, his times in life, page 146-47. The Molech of Ammon corresponded closely with the Chemosh of Moab. One of those names was Ashtar Chemosh from the Moabite stone, line 17, showing him to be the main principle corresponding to the female Ashtarot. The 700, he's talking about the wives, 700 of 1 Kings 11.3 is probably an accidental corruption of 70. We do not know, however, that as a prince, he had any great opportunity of showing his predilections that he shared at all in the direction of affairs under his father. The impression left by the scriptural narrative is that down to his father's death, he lived a mere courtier's life, a life without serious aims or stirring circumstances. But a time came when there suddenly devolved upon him a great and most serious responsibility Solomon died at an age which could not have greatly exceeded 60. And Rehoboam, at the age of 41, found himself recognized as the natural heir to the throne and successor to his father's kingdom in its entirety. At first, no voice was raised to dispute the title. No arm was lifted to oppose him. The news, indeed, of Solomon's death had brought back from Egypt a discontented and ambitious refugee who had a certain number of adherents and may, who may have entertained the hopes of pushing himself into notice if trouble or difficulty should arise. Jeroboam, who had fled to the court of Shishak, or Shishank, king of Egypt, on a mere charge of cherishing treasonable intentions, naturally returned to his own land as Moses had done. When the king who sought his life was dead and attended the gathering which was to give popular sanction to a succession universally regarded as natural and proper. The gathering was held at Shechem, the chief city of Ephraim, whether by Rehoboam's appointment or spontaneous movement on the part of the tribes is uncertain. It is perhaps most probable that Rehoboam designated Shechem as the place for his inauguration in a conciliatory spirit, hoping therefore to gratify the Ephraimites and secure their support and favor. But his concession was by some interpreted as weakness. The oppressive rule of Solomon during the latter years of his reign the heavy taxes which he imposed upon subjects for the support of his court, 1 Kings 4, 7 to 23, and the forced labor which he exacted from them had given rise to a general discontent, and the government of the wise king had become odious to the Israelites as that of the race of Tarkin, in spite of all their splendid works, indeed partly on account of them afterwards to the inhabitants of Rome. <clears throat> we may be sure that all the crafty and unscrupulous Jeroboam fomented the popular ill will. It was probably in consequence of his machinations that on the meeting of the tribes, their, comp their complaints were formulated and delegates named, Jeroboam being among the number, 1 Kings 12, 3 to carry them to the king and to plead for redress of grievances. 
Thy father, said their spokesman, probably Jeroboam himself, made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. The abolition of forced labor and a reduction of taxation would, so far as it appears, have contented them. They have, they have had no thought of revolt. They probably expected that their very moderate demands, as they consider them, would be cheerfully granted, and that the young king would be glad to purchase the popularity which most princes desire on their coronation day by the making of a few promises which need not perhaps be altogether irrevocable. The young king perceived, or those who were about him suggested to him, the matter was one which required deliberation. Prerogative was in question, and the prerogative naturally dear to kings, nor have there ever been wanting at any time or in any country sticklers for prerogative among the hangers-on of the court, more loath to yield one jot or tittle of it than the kings themselves. Persons of this class, no doubt, pointed out to Rohrabond that it was no light matter that was in question, but really the very character of the monarchy itself. Solomon had won for himself the privilege which great monarchs of the East have always enjoyed, and which was at that time possessed and exercised by the kings both of Egypt and Assyria. The privilege of exacting from their subjects as much forced labor as they pleased was his successor to surrender the right moment it was objected to. If he did, might not further demands be made? Might not the royal power be gradually cramped and limited? until it became a mere shadow, at any rate. No, just a second here. <clears throat> the subject was one for grave debate. It was probably felt to be quite reasonable. Reply, when Jeroboam returned answer to his discontented subjects, that he would communicate to them his decision on the third day. Rehoboam is said to have first asked the council of old men, the graybeards, who had acted for many years as his father's counselors, and who might be expected to have derived from their contact with the wisest of men, and from long experience of affairs, something of that calm spirit of true worldly wisdom, which had characterized a large part of Solomon's rule. Their advice was that he should adopt a mild and conciliatory tone, that he should speak good words, yield, at any rate to some extent, or seem to yield, and thus please the malcontents, who, they ventured to say, would be peaceable and tractable subjects thenceforth, if they seemed to themselves to have got their way under existing circumstances. The advice was probably not palatable, at any rate, it was not taken. Rehoboam turned to the younger men, the men of his own standing, bold spirits who had none of the timidity of age and who might well seem to him more competent interpreters of the temper of his own day than persons who belonged to a generation that was just dying off. The young men were imbued with all the contempt for popular demands and all the pride and insolence of an era and exclusive aristocracy. Their counsel was that era but bone should not yield an inch. A fool was, was rightly answered according to his folly. Thus shalt thou speak unto them, they said. My little finger will be thicker than my father's loins. For as my father did lead you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with a cat of nine tails. It was rash and foolish counsel, but the king followed it. He forsook the old men's counsel and took the young men's counsel roughly, rudely, cruelly. Not only, they were told, should there be no alleviation of the burdens, but the weight of them should be 
added and aggravated. Rehoboam's little finger should be thicker than his father's loins. It was a proud, fierce, foolish answer. And the consequences were such as any man of moderate prudence might have anticipated. Disappointed and disgusted, the multitude burst out of the city. What portion do we have in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. The tribal spirit was strong among the Jews. The supremacy of Judah had never been otherwise than grudgingly accepted. Reuben, Ephraim, Manasseh perpetually kicked against Judean sovereignty. Thus there was always a latent discontent which any breeze might any day blow into a flame. At this time, Rehoboam's silly threats were the spark which fired the train. Okay, see you later. Oh, come on over. All right, I'm out. Okay, I'll see you later. Uh, I love you. Love Give you me a hug. Too. Give me a hug. Okay. Oh, I love you. I'll see you later. Right? Okay, drive safe. Stay right, right, right. Yep, I will. Be safe. Love you. Love you too, love. Not hearing them all the tribes, excepting three, burst out into open revolt. Levi, thoroughly content with its grand position at the head of the religion of the kingdom, gave its sympathies to the Davidic cause, ultimately gravitated to the southern kingdom. <clears throat> but Reuben, which had claimed the right of the firstborn, Ephraim, which had given to the nation Joshua, the conqueror, Deborah, the prophetess, and Samuel, the last and greatest of the judges, Manasseh, which shared largely in the glories of its brother tribe, Ephraim, Zebulun, which sucked out the abundance of the seas, Gad, which dwelt as a lion, Daniel, the lion's whelp, Issachar, the strong ass crouching between two burthens, Naphtali, the hind let loose, and Asher, the dweller in far north, drew off the Davidic yoke declaring themselves independent of Judah and proclaim their intention of placing themselves under a new king. Still failing to appreciate the situation and imagining that compromise was even yet possible, Rehoboam resolved one more effort to prevent the disruption and sent an envoy, no doubt with an offer of some sort of compromise to his revolting subjects. But with the wrong headedness which characterized all his proceedings at this period of his life, he selected for one envoy, one of the persons most obnoxious to the malcontent, no other than his father's chief director of forced labors, which were so unpopular, Adoram or Adoniram. Rebels seemed to consider this as adding insult to injury. And that's where we need to stop for now. <clears throat> Verse 3 of hymn 705. With gratitude and humble trust, we bring our best to thee to serve thy cause and share thy love with all humanity. O thou gavest us thyself in Jesus Christ, thy son. Help us to give ourselves each day until work is done. All atonement stuff seems to disappear. May have to switch hymnals. Let us pray. Lord, give us discernment and insight to see the deceits of the human heart and human history, such as we have here with Rehoboam, such as we may have here with this hymn. And we may not be taken or captured by wiles and subtlety. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Till next time, Godspeed.